Vsekega ministra je najljepša hvala, da se je tega včas in kljub težkemu dnevu nas je obiskal tukaj na Akademiji. Sedaj pa imam posebno čast in veselje, da predstavim našega cenjenega gosta. To je profesor Sr. Lešek Šištov Boriševič. Njegov kurikulno vidite ob vsega pet strani. Tako da ob tej priložnosti lahko povem nekaj najpomembnejših podatkov. Je ogleden znanstvenik in profesor z področja medicine. Je član Royal Society. Zadažen pa svet pa je najpomembneje, da je vrsto let vodil univerza v Cambridgeu. Več let je vodil tudi Angliško agencijo za financiranje medicinskih rediskov. Sedaj predseduje v stanovi Cancer Research UK in je aktiven v odboru UK Research and Innovation. Naslov njegovega današnjega predavanja pa je Cambridge and the UK. Maintaining excellence in unstable times. Professor Borisevic, after this short introduction, I'm kindly inviting you to the floor. Please. President, uh, thank you so much for the honor of being able to be here with you today. And particularly, I would like to uh, acknowledge my close friend, uh, President Denshaw, who we had the privilege of working together on the establishment of Science Europe uh, back uh, about six or seven years ago. The minister's comments today uh, are actually very relevant. Because if I leave you with one message, is if you feel you are in unstable times, I would really say this is an international phenomenon for all universities and the academic institutions at the present time. We're living at a point of conjunction where there is increasing demand from politics to be able to get benefit to society and out of universities. I will also add that wherever you are in the world, it is also linked to the political problem that they're not prepared to pay for it. <coughs> and at the second time, we actually have a variety of movements within society that actually seek to restrict the academic freedoms that we enjoy in academic institutions. And therefore we have this collision of universes happening at the present time <coughs> where there is ever greater need for academic institutions but those academic institutions are often under attack from a variety uh, of sources. To try to examine this, what I'd like to do is to go back to very fundamental principles. Why universities? Why did universities start? Most people will go back to the ancient Greeks. Uh, yes, but the reality is the university movement is a European movement. And I say that even though I'm from the United Kingdom. It is a pan-European <coughs> movement starting in Northern Italy. What was the purpose of universities back in 1100 uh, AD? The main purpose was the training of clergy and the training of administrators to support the state. It was not about discovery of new knowledge, it was about the provision of high quality manpower that was actually going to be necessary to make state systems run. So monarchs could go hunting, fishing, shooting and doing all sorts of things, but underneath it they had a competent group of individuals who could actually manage the state uh, for them. This has evolved. But there are certain principles, certainly within the United Kingdom, that we have always held absolutely as inviolate for universities and for academic institutions. 
And in a very British way, because we don't have a written constitution, these have never been written down, but always accepted that we must operate to these principles until the Higher Education and Research Act, which was passed by Parliament in 2016. Uh, nobody paid too much attention to this because you will note that that date, this was passed five days before the referendum for Brexit, which dominated the news headlines. But in that act, it enshrined three principles for the first time uh, in Britain. That universities have to sustain academic freedom. Now be careful what's meant by academic freedom. It's the right to think and to do uh, as individual academics. It is not a right to impact on other academics' ability to do what it is. So it does not mean that if you want to uh, have the world's biggest MRI machine, you should actually demand from the vice chancellor or the rector that he must support you uh, in this way. It comes with the responsibility of academics having to fund and to seek support for the research that they want to do, but within the institution, they have the right to do that. The second right is very important in the United Kingdom, and that is that each university in the United Kingdom is an autonomous body. Now that means that the relationship between the state and the university is very different to the ones we find on the continent of Europe, and that is quite difficult uh, to get across, but it is in fact at the core of many of the European debates that occur at universities is a fundamental misunderstanding of the position of a university in Britain, which is more akin to the position of a university in the United States. So when I'm appointed, I am not elected as vice chancellor of the University of Cambridge. The academics can only refuse me. They can't necessarily vote somebody else in, in uh, my place as a vice chancellor. They are professional positions. And you have to run the university. And if you make the university bankrupt, there is no government bailout uh, as to how that university operates. So the university takes some resource from the government. In the case of Cambridge, it's only about 20% of the funding of Cambridge comes from government. The rest has to be brought in from elsewhere. And that is the responsibility of autonomy. So autonomy comes with rights and privileges in that we can refuse to do what the government wants us to do. But it also comes with the responsibility of ensuring that the students receive a proper education, that science is supported, and the highest principles of ethics are sustained in the institution. And the last principle that it was enshrined is a peculiarly British principle called the Haldane Principle. And this is to prevent the sort of pork barreling that occurs in the United States. And it's a constraint on ministers. What it actually says is the politician decides on the total sum of money that he or she wishes to spend, usually through the finance ministry, on science and research. And that's the last decision they can take. They hand that over entirely to the body, the United Kingdom Research and Innovation Board, to allocate to the best projects. And the minister, from that point on, has no influence how that money is spent. So a huge amount of trust involved in that, um, and ministers having to give up, and believe me, they do not do so willingly uh, very often, and will seek to interfere. But nevertheless, it is now enshrined in the act that they actually have to acquiesce to this position. So a huge amount of independence for the university sector principle that is often lost in the European context is the fact that universities are the major source of R&D in the United Kingdom. So just as in America, we do not have a large number of institutes. We never went into that Bismarckian German model, largely because British universities and the philosophy of universities in Britain go back before that 
to, again, a German philosopher, but actually to the Humboldt model, not to the model of institutes that was created in Germany in the late 19th century. Historic reason for that is that Prince Albert married Victoria and actually came over with a Humboldtian idea before Bismarck started in Germany uh, organizing higher education in a different way. And because of Britain's linkages to the United States and the empire, that has been transposed into Indian, Canadian, Australian, and other universities around the world, but set on a different path from most European universities. And this state dependence is therefore very different in Britain. But underneath it all, and I won't spend as long on most of the other slides, is something that is absolutely fundamental. The reason universities can operate is that universities only operate because the trust that society places in those universities. And in Britain, that trust, believe it or not, is much, much greater than society's trust in politicians. The public would rather support the university very often than governments, and certainly at the moment, if you watch the political turmoil in Britain, that is very much the case. But if we as universities or research bodies lose the trust of the public, then we are in real trouble. So it's a very interesting social compact that is actually made between society and universities entirely based on something completely subjective and a view and a belief by society that if it supports universities, good for society will come out of them. Now, Cambridge is a strange university, even by United Kingdom standards. And this, these sets of slides come with a health warning. Look at some of the things Cambridge is doing. <coughs> Please do not be horrified at the sums of money and budgets I'm going to show you. Because looking at the total GDP of um, Slovenia, you would in essence be putting about 5% of your GDP into an institution. That would be the equivalent that you have to bear in mind. But I want to focus on principles. Uh, we pride ourselves on being one of the world's leading academic centers and one of the oldest universities. Unfortunately, <coughs> behind our good friends in Oxford, but that's the way it is. We can't rewrite history. You are all used to reading mission statements from companies. They usually last uh, go on for pages and paragraphs and caveats. The mission statement of the University of Cambridge for the last 400 years has been one sentence. And it's very important as to what sits at the front end of that sentence. The role of the university is to contribute to society, and you notice it hasn't been defined as national society or elsewhere. We interpret it as global society through the pursuit of education, learning, and research at the highest international levels of excellence. And that's it. There are no caveats, ifs, ands, buts, pages, or anything else. Uh, believe me, as Vice Chancellor, I could give you a sermon on any <coughs> of those words, but it sums up what we are about as an institution. We are, and pride ourselves on being probably the <coughs> leading research university. Some might quibble, but uh, uh, that's how we view ourselves. We are relatively small. Only 12,000 undergraduates. We are therefore very meritocratic in entry. Standards of entry for undergraduate students are among the highest, <coughs> probably even tougher than Harvard uh, in some ways to actually enter into the university as to what is demanded. And we have 6,000 postgraduates. It is unlikely, even with my successor, that the undergraduate number will grow, but the postgraduate number might. There are 150 academic schools, faculties, departments, and uh, institutions within the body of the University of Cambridge. So you can imagine, if you are, if you like, the chief executive of this company with 150 direct reports, it actually means nobody reports anywhere. 
It is the ultimate academic commune, if you like, in the Parisian sense rather than the Stalinist sense of the word. <coughs> it operates not just as a university, but runs subsidiary activities, including running examinations around the world for secondary education. And hence, I'm going to listen with great interest to your <coughs> suggestions as to how Slovenia is going to approach this in the future. Uh, and it has multiple sources of income that have to be managed, including the capacity <coughs> to raise bonds and to go into the marketplace on its own. One of the ironies is that we have a triple A stable rating from the international finance agencies. If the percent of the British government is BBB at the present time and unstable, um, there is often a joke that in reality we should probably be running the country. It would be a, a lot more economic and uh, be better off. But this is, again, to underline how different the role of a university and the running of a university is in the United Kingdom compared to Europe. Celebrated 800 years, famous alumni, but well, you can read them there for yourself. Uh, others will put other names on that. We're ranked in the world top six. I would also say we ignore every league table for uh, 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 that the actually ever is. You will never see a Cambridge University comment on any league table position. Because frankly, we think all these league tables are rubbish. Uh, we do not feel they make any statement because they don't measure teaching, they don't measure the fundamental principles of what universities stand for. They measure what is measurable, which is usually research output. We have 97 <coughs> Nobel Prizes. It's very strictly considered as to what the Nobel Prize is. I love that number for one reason, that if I'm talking to Paris, I point out that France has got 70 um, uh, at the same time. So as an institution, it is organized and geared towards the discovery of fundamental new knowledge in the arts, humanities, and in the sciences. But the last is very important. It is also the largest innovation cluster in Europe. And that has been built on the academic foundations, not on just on investment. Staff profile, it is relatively small as universities go. And I'm only going to ask you to look at one number on that, and it says under researcher, nearly 4,000. That means there are 4,000 postdocs and 4,000 PhD students in the university. And what that translates to is every individual senior investigator in the university has about three postdocs on average and three PhD students each. That's an average. So it gives you some idea of how successful they are at bringing in external resource to support this activity. There's actually more postdocs than there are at Harvard or at Princeton or at <coughs> This is a slide I always get frightened of showing because the annual turnover that you manage as vice chancellor is two billion pounds a year. And that is bigger than most government departments uh, in the, uh, in, in, in the uh, UK. And a, it's a fine balancing act because the money in equals the money out. Um, and here is the income and expenditure accounts that you've got. If you stay plus or minus 1%, you are usually in a good state. You get it wrong by 2%, you are actually going into debt by tens of millions of pounds. So this has to be managed very carefully, and that is where the responsibility of autonomy actually uh, <coughs> resides. Not something that many universities in Europe have to cope with. But with it also comes the responsibility of investment. And here you have to look at the budgets that you've got and you have to invest them in infrastructure. Nobody else is going to do it. So we've just, um, in my last year, 200 million was spent on building a new heart and one hospital. Uh, 400 million was brought in by attracting AstraZeneca as a headquarters building onto the university campus. Um, we are spending one billion pounds on building
building post-doctoral accommodation um, uh, in northwest Cambridge, and the Cavendish Laboratory, those of you who are physicists, is completely being rebuilt from scratch on the, on the same campus at a cost of 400 million. I'm not going to go into where we find the money for that. It isn't just from endowments, but it's by issuing bonds, uh, going into financial markets to be able to get this, as well as grants that come in. But the main point is, is the responsibility <coughs> to the of the university. If these projects go bad, there's nobody else. There's no safety net. There's no parachute that will help you uh, land. So if you want autonomy, you have to realize that's the responsibility that comes with it. There are clouds on the horizon for universities in the United Kingdom, and I think you could probably write exactly the same list here in Slovenia, or in Belgium, or in Luxembourg, or in Poland, or in Germany. And the pressures that universities are under are under finance, under pensions, which is a peculiarity that if you are an independent entity, you have to provide pensions for your academic staff. That isn't something if you're part of the state system. So I'm going to talk less about that, but it is quite a big liability as to how pensions have to be organized. How do you recruit staff? How do you have meritocracy in student entry? How do you retain staff? Uh, how much do you pay them? Everybody in Britain gets paid at different rates in different universities. There isn't a standard uh, that is applied to universities. We, the Higher Education Bill has produced a new government regulator, as well as changing the whole of the research funding scenario, Brexit, but more importantly for us, the Immigration Bill, as to how it might restrict freedom of movement of academics, is actually something that impacts on staff recruitment. So I've set myself an exam question. If I put myself on an arbitrary scale of minus five bad to plus five good for universities, where do I see the risk profile uh, of these various areas? And I have to tell you now, all you're going to see is mostly red. Uh, finance is a very big issue and all of it is negative rather than positive for universities in the United Kingdom at the moment. Pensions is a nightmare, and that is because of pensions deficits uh, that uh, you have to look at. Staff retention and remuneration is being made more and more difficult, as we heard from the President, by the competition from industry employing uh, young people at very inflated rates. If you're in machine learning at the moment, your starting salary with a major company after a PhD is 250,000 euros. That is what a major German company will today pay for a PhD student coming out with a PhD in machine learning. Um, I think most professors in the room would actually pale into thinking as to how much, what the going market rates really are out there. So, students are being regulated in the United Kingdom. And again, when you have a regulator, they don't care about anything other than the customer. And we have this strangeness that the language for students in Britain is now the language of provider and customer, uh, uh, rather than st student and study. This is straight commercial business speak, and it comes with that issue of autonomy that the student basically purchases from the university activity with the government giving the student the loan to be able to afford that education, but with it comes a government regulator. Research, the government's put more than <coughs> two billion pounds a year extra, and that's the reason the, the only green you see on this slide, is that potentially this could be a huge benefit to the university sector. Uh, but most of that research money is being targeted at applied research rather than fundamental research. So be careful uh, what you wish for. Brexit, I'm going to be relatively brief on and happy to take it in questions, but the university sector is seen as an unmitigated disaster. But that's something that I've got to be careful of. I'll put my cards on the table. I'm an absolutely rapid remainder within uh, Europe. So, uh, others may paint that picture differently. 
But the biggest risk is the immigration bill, which is as we restrict freedom of movement, we will fail to attract the very best people that our universities have thrived on in a very international environment. <coughs> so finance. How do politicians in Britain today portray universities? They portray universities as very rich institutions. They will point at Cambridge because we have the world's <coughs> six branches in down to over three to four billion pounds. They portray leaders of universities as fat cats, the equivalent of bankers, that uh, we are overpaid, uh, don't do enough, uh, and we trade on underprivileged students. That's the sort of headlines you get from the British media, that we're elitists, that we stand and don't allow for equality or diversity in the system, and we're too independent, we can't be controlled, and shouldn't the government and the elected representatives really control what universities are doing? So, a very interesting perspective that politicians give, which is a rather negative view of universities, in contrast to the sort of view that society takes of universities. Um, basically, they're politicians. They want to control, they want to be able to devise, and as I said, they don't want to pay for it either. So, the consequences are, why should the taxpayer actually continue to support the university? But then they also recognise their national importance. And your minister made a very important point today that the wealth of society is ultimately going to be dependent in tomorrow's world by the level of education that is attained by the younger population in the country. So they may not totally like the universities, but they also accept that the universities are the only show in town that that by which that can be achieved. So they want to control, but they don't want to actually uh, um, disrupt what's going on. But they, as politicians, they also want to pass the blame if anything does go wrong onto the, uh, away from themselves and onto the institutions. So, that's an international phenomenon, that isn't something that's in Britain. But with this come threats to financing. In Britain, the model I've described where the student pays a fee, uh, there is a cap on that fee. The government gives the student a loan at a ridiculous rate of interest of nearly 3.1% when market rates are much lower. The reason for the difference is you have to cover dropout students uh, in the interest rates in order to make the books balance. So it is not a, a good model. It's not sustainable. We know it's not. The company that runs this is about 10 billion sterling in debt. So it's unsustainable. But if the government brings universities back onto the government accounting books, it actually throws the national debt out by uh, another 20%. So they kind of stuck with it, whether they like it or not. And even the opposition party, which stood at the last election on cancelling all student debts, have now completely backpedaled, because when they looked at the books, they realised they can't do this. They haven't got the resources to be able to do this. And so student debt, as in the United States, is going to become a big issue over the next 10 years. So the government has got a restricted number of options. They can restrict the number of uh, how much the fee is, is charged. But if we don't get the money, we can't teach. If you reduce student numbers, which is a quick way of uh, dropping the costs, that is politically <coughs> unacceptable to the electorate. It can reduce research funding, but in a way that's cutting off your nose to spite your face if your whole country is totally dependent on innovation. So that isn't a very attractive option. It can throw more onto the charity sector. This is peculiarly British, that the British give an enormous amount of money for research. And that is something that they're looking to promote by reducing taxation burdens on charities. Or they can regulate and impose rules. The universities have got a limited number of options. They can go completely independent of private. Just say to the government, don't give us your 20%, we'll do without that. I'll find somebody that the money from somewhere else, but don't you come to us at all. We don't want anything to do with you, we were just go independent. 
I personally don't like that because I believe governments should have an interest in how young people in a country are, are really educating. But I do have, I did have members of staff who felt very strongly that this is what we should be doing. And I can tell you most of our philanthropists would give the university billions of dollars if we just became completely independent. They like the idea of having nothing to do with government. Uh, I think that's a nature. Or what academics are good at is let's contextualize the argument and change the debate if we possibly can. And that is probably the course that is most of being taken. Alternative sources are development of new partnerships, both with the commercial and private sector. And that's important because they're becoming an ever more important source. But the question for universities is how do you control the contracting nature of those relationships and retain academic freedom as a principle where you will turn down monies coming in from the private sector. So you must never allow the private sector to dictate how the university is going to operate under the principle of academic freedom. And the investments need to be long term. It is no good getting three year, four year, you need 20 year relationships if you're going to go there. Building endowments, well, we have one, um, but outside of Cambridge and Oxford, no British university has any substantial endowment. And raising money for that, I can tell you, is extremely difficult. And then making alumni give money. So we started a campaign during my tenure. That campaign has now raised 1.2 billion pounds. So this is just our alumni giving money to the university. And that's great because that money allows us to do things that are outside strategies of government or elsewhere and allows us to keep departments such as theology, philosophy and others that will never make large sums of money, but allows us to keep the integrity of a higher education institution. Pensions I'm just going to pass over because this is far more of a UK issue, but staff recruitment the issues are exactly the same as you face in Slovenia. How do you maintain quality? How do you recruit globally? Because academic recruitment is a global business. It is not one any longer of national or of regional uh, importance. The competition is coming from China. You might expect me to say the United States. The competition is Chinese and South Asian uh, in, in the main at the present time. And immigration controls of any sort are going to mitigate against you. And Brexit is a particular issue for us. And then there's equality and diversity and harassment and other issues. But in Britain, we decide how much we pay. There is no centralized uh, scheme. So uh, we can pay an orthopedic surgeon twice the salary you pay the vice chancellor. And that is because if they operate on poor drivers, means, believe me, they can earn that in one operation. Um, so different areas, like machine learning, will earn much more than a professor in theology or mathematics is going to earn. <coughs> and the university has to come to terms with these variations. Um, it, it is the market force that will dictate levels of salary um, that, that you pay. And believe me, that does cause an academic argument. And will we be left at the end of this day of this concentration of 15 to 20 global universities that now begin to dominate like the multinationals do the business world? I leave that as a question to you to really ponder as to then where do all universities begin to fit in that model? Um, it's, it's the ultimate way in which polarization uh, <coughs> and recruitment may well go. I don't think that's a good issue. This regulation by the Office of Students is all about cost. It's about driving down costs and debt for individual students. And it's giving the students a voice as a consumer. And many of us don't like this because, of course, we don't like to think of the student as a consumer. In the Humboldtian philosophy, you will remember, it is the teacher and the student working together to achieve new knowledge. That's the fundamental principle of Humboldt's philosophy. It doesn't quite fit with the philosophy of a consumer uh, of a commodity, which we never consider it to be. Again, that is a political perspective. 
And by bridging research and innovation, I'm just going to skip to this slide, which gives you some idea of the R&D budgets that are now merged under one office in the United Kingdom with responsibility for all government funding of uh, uh, research in the arts, humanities, sciences, and elsewhere. So it looks fantastic. Four, about 4,000 grants issued to academics every year. <coughs> But the most important is that the British government, despite everything else, has agreed that it is going to rise from 1.6% to 2.4% uh, by 2027, which means it's going to have to find an additional £7 billion a year for research uh, in this area. And they're trying to sell Brexit as adding a billion to that uh, sum, which of course is not an added sum because Britain does very well from the uh, European agencies to bring that money in. In fact, it's less money than uh, the country to Britain to go. The one area I just want to focus on is this relationship with business. There is still an obsession in many countries that business is large-scale business. Your president was absolutely right in what he was saying. Business today around universities are two to three person operations often in software, often in life sciences, they're small companies. But uh, Cambridge has built Europe's largest cluster of these activities. So within a 20 say, kilometer radius of Cambridge itself, a small town, 100,000 people, 600,000 the total population, there are 4,000 new high-tech companies. Nearly one in five of all high-tech companies starting in Britain now start in that radius. So this ancient university has transformed itself over 50 years to be the high-tech hub of the United Kingdom. There are, uh, these companies have created over 57,000 jobs. So this is payback to society, if you like, of what we do. I'm quite happy to talk about how we do it, but it brings into the exchequer an activity which you don't see from small and medium-sized enterprises of 13 billion sterling just from this one region uh, alone. Uh, so small is very much beautiful. And as those companies grow, uh, they also bring in considerable wealth. 16 of companies are valued at over a billion dollars, and two are valued at 10 billion. And you have all seen the chip manufacturer that we uh, recently sold to Japan for 30 odd billion dollars. So these companies grow and they're very successful. <coughs> so it does have negatives in that house prices in Cambridge have now risen to the price of London housing. Uh, people want to live there. Transport, the roads are choked. I think your traffic here is so light, I can't imagine mm. uh, how. Uh, it would be if Cambridge could operate a traffic system like this where the roads are choked, schools are full, uh, housing is a, uh, a real premium. So there is a price to pay for success. Uh, believe me, it's a price I'd be, I'm very glad to be paying uh, in that area. One word on Brexit. What can one say? Um, a mess is about the only way to describe it. Uh, let us assume for a moment that Britain will leave under some terms. I, I still haven't given up hope that that may not happen, but that is a personal view. The current political position is we will leave. The academic community is unusually united. We have 157 academic uh, higher education institutions. For the only time in the history of Britain, we had an absolutely unanimous vote of all academic institutions that we all wanted to remain in Europe. The consequence of that was there was no debate about this at all. We never got a voice in the whole referendum because we couldn't show conflict on television uh, uh, for, for debate because it was a unanimous, absolutely united view. The loss of EU structural funds in regions of the United Kingdom, such as the region that uh, I come from in Wales, is huge. If you take 100 uh, as the <coughs> EU norm uh, for uh, areas economic benefit, 
In inner West London, it operates at 611%. That's six times the European average in terms of wealth. The part of the United Kingdom we're from, my wife and I in West Wales, uh, for her, is 62%. So these inequalities in Britain are greater than in most other European countries. And these regions, like Wales, have been bailed out by structural funds. Guess what? After Brexit, there is no structural fund going to these regions. So this is a real internal debate and problem. Our biggest anxiety is we don't know where we will sit, either with Brussels or with the United Kingdom. And it is this problem that nobody wants to debate it, but Barney and Juncker have said nothing is decided until everything is decided, which means science, technology, and higher education could be traded off against fisheries, common agricultural policy. You know, those are bigger financial uh, issues. Universities can be relatively small. Oh, they'll be all right. And remember, we think in terms of 20 years, politicians think in terms of four. So, uh, you know, they won't notice the difference in four years, but the world will notice it in 20 years. And we're worried about collaboration um, and Something that I'm noticing is while the EU in Brussels has a unanimous, united front, once you start exploring, there are going to be, as once the decisions are made, there will be as many fractures in the EU position as there are in the British position. It's just they're very much better at covering it over than we are in Britain. But there are opportunities, but they are all dependent on the scale at which you operate and the risk which comes down to the individual institution. It's not risks that have been taken by government. It comes with this issue of autonomy. So in conclusion, I would argue that the underlying pressures on universities are unsustainable if you're going to maintain quality. So you have to resolve all of these issues. Will you resolve them? Probably not to everyone's satisfaction, but you will make gradual progress. And I'm sure you're going to face exactly the same pressures that I've described in Britain in a different way here in Slovenia, or I'm seeing them also in Poland, I've seen them in the Czech Republic, I've seen them in Germany. So the pressures are more or less the same. They come under different titles and from different sources, but they're not going to be any different. Sector differentiation will become the norm. That means that in the United Kingdom we will have 10 or so high research producing universities because what is happening is postdocs and others aggregate to those institutions that are large in order to protect their own career and that's where the infrastructure is being placed. So increasingly the pull of infrastructure is going to polarize into universities. I argue that this is not a good thing because if you narrow the base of a pyramid, the flow through of brain power is actually going to be very small and you will have a lower number of PhD students that you can attract from an ever-shrinking base. So pouring in more money into the top by shrinking the bottom is not the way in which this is going to be achieved. Every university has a function and everyone should have some opportunity to engage in the research and development activity, but extremely difficult to sell that. Risk aversion. What is the risk appetite? And you can see the risks that I've had to run to take. Any one of those projects goes wrong, or an archaeologist finds a Greek temple or something, the first one in Britain underneath the foundations, uh, you are completely uh, stymied and you have to carry the costs and burdens. There's no use going to get that. International competitiveness, I'm just going to put one word there, China. Stop thinking United States, start thinking China and start thinking the Far East and, and Asia. Just the speed and scale of development there is astronomical. And external forces will dominate and there's very little you can do about it. So it's an uncomfortable position. You can write lists of them, but actually your capacity to influence them is going to be less. So more time you spend on mitigation than on actually being able to influence. But partnerships 
collaborations and working together may be a solution. So united we stand and ultimately divided <coughs> we may all fall. Thank you very much.
And if they control the register of universities, if you cross a line they don't want you to cross, they'll merely deregister you as a university. So this is quite a dangerous development from my point of view, uh, because it breaks this fundamental philosophy that a student is not just a consumer, they are a contributor to our overall development as a society. Uh, and a student's got more responsibility than merely taking for themselves out of the system. I have a fundamental belief that it is also their responsibility to give <coughs> back as a consequence of the knowledge uh, and that they've actually gained. Uh, so I oppose this very vehemently, but it has resonance, as you could imagine, with a uh, with politicians who want to move into that sort of. Uh, if you pay X, you get Y as a consequence. It's a much easier economic argument than the one that I might be putting forward, which is that there is a general public good out of a well-educated population. And believe me, I do a little work now with uh, Siemens. What's the thing that Siemens looks like when it establishes any activity elsewhere? It looks at the level of education or in terms of seeing as the level of engineering education that is actually there in the workforce for them to be able to invest in that. So one has to be open to government and say, do you know what? That, you remember that American movie, Build It and They Will Come? The answer is they've got to have a little bit of faith. The danger for politicians is it won't happen in four years. It's more like 20 years. Therefore, no politician will ever benefit from the investment they make, even though society might be more. So two more short questions. The third one, Professor Peral and Professor Svetli, the fourth one. Let the changes of technology, like uh, digitalization, informatization, 4K industry, robotization, these will all influence the labor market, but it may also influence the universities. They have to change to adapt. How do you expect universities to change in the next five or 10 years or 15 years? And what's about the critical mass of higher education institutions? Is this an issue or not? So uh, the last question, I think the critical mass of higher education institutions, I think, is, is vital. And that is, the University of Cambridge can only thrive in the UK system because my alma mater at Cardiff is able to provide a source of high quality students feeding in. So the top universities then take off uh, the very best at a much higher level. But it is totally dependent <coughs> on the market coming through uh, the system. It's a very simple economic argument, Keynesian argument that, uh, that, that would dictate this model. So you must maintain a larger number of institutions to keep it broad. Uh, so I think the critical mass, there isn't a number you can put on it, but I can tell you it's bigger than seven or 10 for a country the size of, of the United Kingdom. I think here, You've got the massive universities and tertiary institutions which can feed the top institutions to give you that uh, area. Technology, technology will impact on the way we teach. So my own view is if Cambridge tomorrow stopped giving any formal lectures, I couldn't care less. I don't think formal lectures matter at all. What will matter is an ever increasing focus on small group teaching responsiveness by academics towards online questions, uh, small group tutorials, that much more personal social side of education which is ignored by the MOOC movement around the world. Uh, you, know, you really have to be in a room to be able to make an academic argument, uh, to be able to convince others. That's part of the learning process. I'm sorry, you don't get that off a computer screen. So you can get facts off a computer screen, you can learn those facts and you can assimilate those facts. But actually, eventually, there is a human component. So I believe universities will always have a place, but it won't be the place of formal lecturing as we know it today. And frankly, I don't really care that much. I've been to history lectures where clearly the person has got the same dog-eared notes they're reading out for the last 20 years. Um, it is much better that it's a forward-looking uh, type of education. And don't underestimate the importance of group learning. When you go into a university library today, it's noisy. 
is not the place of silence. The students today want to learn in groups. They self-assemble into groups. They argue with each other. They have bring in different facts. They all have their computers in front of them. They don't go to the shelves to get books. It's a very different type of learning. I wanted to make myself very unpopular in Cambridge, suggesting that instead of having the library, which we open almost 24-7 now, that we actually have a building next to it which uh, serves pizzas as, as well, which I think would have been great and a great money owner for the university because they would spend a lot of time uh, actually in it. To encourage that self-learning is, is vital. Proceeders, I think the last question. Yeah. Uh, Cambridge University ranked six in the world ranking. Yes. How much does business and uh, technology structure all around contributes to that? Uh, so, I don't think business, uh, business is much cleverer than looking at legal tables. But what business does is it looks for where there is a unique edge and an opportunity. So even taking Cambridge as a business, we're investing at the moment, when my, in my last year we invested very heavily in India, in Bangalore and in the life sciences sector in Bangalore to put some companies and some academics into that area. Not the first thing you would say on world ranking tables Bangalore is going to be there. But what you do is, is you look at the environment as a whole and that's what business uh, tends to do. So it so happens that there are fantastic <coughs> hospitals there that actually operate on telemedicine for the whole of uh, South Asia. So you have access to a population of nearly 500 million for future trials. You actually have an infosys with all of the data scientists you could want. Uh, in India, you have chemistry, which uh, actually operates at about half the price of uh, those in Western Europe. You begin to put that together, now it becomes a great environment for a startup pharmaceutical. And so you then build in the partnerships with CIPLA and elsewhere. And that's an example of how it's actually done. So they don't just look and say, oh, Harvard is great. AstraZeneca, interestingly, made the choice to move to Cambridge and not to Boston or Cambridge in Boston. It's a great academic address, Cambridge, by the way. Um, but they made that choice. Why did they make that choice when you challenge them? They said Boston's now living too crowded. We can't find our space. Because if we come here, we're going to get great science that's competitive, but we also can have our own identity and space. Because those large companies are also looking for their identity and their unique competitive advantage. The trick for universities with business is a very important one. That the business has to understand that you will not sacrifice academic freedom, the right to publish, the right to dissent, and the right to criticize that industry. All of those, the company has to give up. So if it wants to enter into a at <coughs> Cambridge, it has to sign all of those away. Um, believe it or not, if you have the reputation, they will do that because they will still see the advantage uh, of the interaction today. Thank you. Thank you.